almost nine o'clock. Thank you all for coming out. By the way, happy birthday to Carrie. So. Another year over and another year over. Okay, this talk is titled Knit to Pearl One. So if you're here for the Bitcoins, you're a little bit early. Uh, this is a uh, talk we developed on how your programming language evolved from knitting. I'm Dave Stokes. I'm a community manager for MySQL. This is my wife, Carrie. Our seventh anniversary is coming up. She was a science teacher for 27 years at the middle school level. So the scars aren't visible, but they are there. <laughs> Imagine if you're a programmer and something you code lasts for a while. Uh, my record was 17 years for something I wrote for the U.S. Air Force, and they kept chasing me down every couple of years for updates until finally the DEC KL 1090 and 1091 series disappeared. But imagine you wrote something today, and it was still in production a year from now. For most programmers, that's fairly typical. Now, five years from now, that means they probably moved you off to another project and called you back and said, hey, remember the stuff you wrote five years ago? Um, uh, we need it updated. But what if you wrote something today and they called you up in the year 6018 and saying they wanted a maintenance release? I'd be impressed to be able to find me, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, knitting patterns from the ancient Egyptians from 4,000 years ago are still around and still usable. Uh, by the way, this is a pair of Egyptian socks, and you can tell all Egyptians had two big toes. That's why they walked like that. <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, what patterns are still good? Pro uh, codes that someone wrote 4,000 years ago are still still available? Well, this is a talk about the fiber arts community and how it differs from the open source community. And there's some things there I wish we could culturally appropriate um, from that. And Carrie's going to talk about the various knitting arts. Um, a lot of you guys in here today, ladies, the fiber arts community involves knitting, crocheting, spinning, um, weaving, and so forth. But there's other fiber arts out there as well, and we're not going to talk about all of that today because it's really short, a little 40 minute talk. Um, but um, we basically wanted to talk about the differences between the two communities, a little bit of the history of knitting um, or the fiber arts. The fiber arts have been going on for 4,000 years. Uh, 
the knitting ages has really shifted down. Uh, it's no longer your granny shawl or afghan that they're making. Uh, there's a lot of innovative designs. Uh, independent yarn dyeing and manufacturing is now a major business. Uh, the audience is large for things like podcasts and blogs. And along with uh, everything else in life, the materials are better, the tools are better, the access to information is a lot better. And this is all facilitated by one website in particular that we'll detail a little bit later. Um, these are just a few pictures. Uh, the picture in red uh, is what we typically think of knitting. Uh, it's, uh, you know, when, when you're sitting around knitting a sweater, you knit and stop and that. And uh, it's what we kind of typically think when we see knitted material. And, uh, but the fiber wire community, they're, they're going above and beyond. And there's all kinds of new place patterns. Um, the two bottom pictures, the colorful one, and then the one right here, that's a technique called brioche that's become very popular in the last three years. And uh, brioche is, is just an example of something that's kind of taken off just in just basically in the last three years. I think it's been around for a while, but um, it's just kind of a way to do some knitting with two colors where you have braid sections. And, but you can create all kinds of designs with that. And that's just one example of some of the things that we see happening. Um, we see a lot of cabling and so forth in knitted and uh, uh, things, but, and we re relate cabling back to the air and oils and, um, you know, cabling different and sweaters and so forth. Um, but we see, that, see those techniques used in a variety of ways and that are very, very accessible through the web website. So on the regional level, you'll see yarn crawls. These are basically marauding bands of knitters going from yarn shop to yarn shop. Uh, then you'll have fiber fest where the yarn shops will gather in one location and then be invaded by the various knitters. Um, and then above that, at a much bigger scale, are the various fiber shows where you'll have people from the sheep industry, uh, the alpaca mafia, don't get me started on the llama folks, um, and the various raw materials are all brought together for consumption, uh, kind of like a computer conference. And attendees, uh, even if it's in the sheep and alpaca industry, they come together at the regional shows to uh, talk about breeds, uh, how you take care of sheep and alpaca and all that. They also show like an animal show and a forage show and show the sheep and, and uh, sheep dogs and, and they have competitions and so forth. Um, it's also where people learn to come and learn about wool and uh, the different types of wool. And until I started knitting uh, probably about six years ago, I didn't realize that there was anything but wool, like the word wool. I, I didn't know about merino versus alpaca versus cashmere and so forth. I just knew that when I went to the store and bought cashmere, that it was really expensive. And cashmere yarn tends to be a little bit of exclusive. So, um, and there's reasons for that. And um, it's availability and where different sheep are, are raised. And you don't just raise sheep that produce cashmere wool, in, but in a few select areas, you don't raise them like for instance in Texas, it's too hot. Um, um, so anyway, it's, it's a place where you can learn a lot of things. Um, I wanted to say this too, for the fiber enthusiast, knowing about different types of wool is kind of a big thing because uh, it, it tends to tell you how that uh, finished garment, like if you're knitting a sweater or something like that, how it's going to drape, how it's going to wear, um, what its wearability is in different weather. Um, like for instance, I bought some um, wool in Scotland last year that I would never wear in Texas except maybe on two days out of the year. But I still bought it and did it because we tend to travel to various locations and I like wool, so I buy it wherever I go. <laughs> Which comes to the word stash, and we'll talk about stash later. Yeah. So um, this is the front page of Ravelry.com, the site that's revolutionized everything. Uh, for you folks who are web designers, you notice that it's bright, attractive, has lots of cute animals on it. I'm not quite sure if the pink stuff there is supposed to be wool or not, but it's very friendly, very attractive, uh, very engaging. Uh, 
like Carrie mentioned, 10 years ago, these folks, uh, what are their first names? Uh, Jess and Casey. Jess and Casey. She was a knitter. He was a programmer. She said, I wish I had a, a website that I could tie all this stuff together. They started off in beta mode, and things took off at a very steep ramp ever since. Uh, it is really the locus of the fiber arts community. Uh, it's no longer just a bunch of little ladies having tea in someone's parlor designing stuff. It's now a massive, interactive, collaborative uh, system. Now, usually the patterns that they're looking for, uh, they're able to communicate about, are in PDF format. And it's one of those things where you can publish your own, have people interact with you on your pattern, and all that. Um, one of the things I want to say about that, too, is about 10 years ago, um, and I just want to give an example of this, there's, an, and I don't pronounce his name very well, but there's a Scottish knitter named Isol T. And she was um, one of the first people, I wouldn't say she was the first, but she was kind of the pioneer at the time. She was one of those mighty girls that um, people had a hard time saying no to. And so she began developing patterns, and she said, I'm going to post them on the internet at a PDF format. And I'm going to sell them a PDF format on the internet. This was a revolutionary idea as far as the knitting community because um, most knitters, when you went out to find a pattern, you either A, bought a book, you went to your local yarn store and they could buy the patterns there, um, or you could buy patterns from various uh, knitting magazines and so forth. So the idea of someone, you know, in, in a lot of the knitting community, um, they are, well, how are you going to make money? Because people are just going to copy these patterns, and even if you post a PDF, you know, they're going to just not worry about your copyright license, and they're just going to reproduce your patterns and so forth. She said, I'm not going to worry about that. And so she was one of the first people that, uh, as far as what I know, and have read about that came up with the idea of, Hey, let's just put it out there and let's make money and we can have a bigger audience. And so that was, that thought process is what I think in a way really, uh, really revolutionized, um, along with Ravelry, really revolutionized what happened in the mid industry. Now, one of the uh, neat features about Ravelry is that various fiber artists can show off their works in progress, you know, what they're working on, get comment, get feedback. Uh, they also can catalog what projects they're working on and the stash. For you non-fiber arts folks, stash is basically a room in your house that's suddenly been taken over by yarn. <laughs> um, it's one of those things where if you're not a fiber artist, you just learn to avoid it. Um, <laughs> but um, it's one of those things where if you have a stash and you have some stuff, you can show off what you have there. As we mentioned earlier, you can find... Uh, usually in PDF format, all sorts of patterns, and you can contact other folks who've made me that pattern, uh, contact the author, uh, get ideas, get help, get suggestions. Uh, it's also a library for projects, and you can also discuss the various projects, uh, lots of links to social media. Uh, you can also find out what the latest and greatest tools are. Uh, there's, by the way, lots of little fiddly bits that you can buy to help make your, your fiber writing better. Uh, database search, so you can go out and say, okay, I have this type of yarn, and I want to make this type of project. How complex is this? And be able to search down and pare down to get a, uh, a small list of uh, patterns to go for. And it's a very, very uh, international website. And since 2010, the fiber arts community has really had a revolutionary rebirth based around this website. Um, we uh, contacted Jess and Casey to talk to them, asking what uh, programs they used and, um, and so forth. And they're going to talk about that here in a minute. But one of the things that I found incredible was in uh, this thing with them. We found out as of November 2017, so just last November, they had over 7 million users of Ravelry.com. And that, uh, that is an exponential growth for a website that went through beta testing and then into development just within 10 years. And it is an international community. Um, I talk on a regular basis, uh, or contact on a regular basis, a lot of UK uh, 
in a pattern, you can post a note that other knitters can read, and they can go back to that problem and say, oh yeah, I'm having that too, and you can research it within Ravelry. The designer can come back and give an answer that reaches out to the whole community within their pattern, and so you can see um, what others are doing. You can also see their pictures of their work, and you can compare it to what you're doing. You can compare it to the size of the garment. Um, and if you want to see how, it, well, my typical is I want to see what that looks like on someone my size. And so I'll go through and I'll look at all the work in progress for a particular like a sweater, and I'll go, oh yeah, she kind of looks like me. I think I can get that. I think that'll fit. And um, and there's some other. I won't tell you about mine. Um, strange and that. Uh, my knitting friends will tell you that I'm not really good at watching, which is a no no. And in the knitting world, and um, I'll go, oh yeah, you know, I'll knit you say, oh yeah, that looks good. Oh yeah, I'll just knit that size. So, yeah, so anyway, but I use a, I use Ravelry a lot for things like that, which is just mine and a little bit. But um, a lot of people are a lot more better at using Ravelry as a tool, and I aspire to do that. I just get in there and it's like non -form. I just want to, I just get in mesh with it and I can spend hours looking at patterns and yarns and and watching people's posts and all of that. So it's, it's an incredible, it's a time sink for me. I can take a, a couple of hours and I can realize the time has gone by. So what does 4,000 year old Egyptian knitting code look like? Uh, a company, a, a shop in New York found this uh, Egyptian pattern and reverse engineered it. And uh, in this case, you can see that they've added a border on the far edges. But if you want to do this, uh, the, the execution code looks like this. Uh, don't worry, we'll make the slides available later. Um, but this is basically um, catting out your 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 uh, .bat file or your C code or your PHP or whatever. This is um, all you need to do. Simple, huh? Um, Carrie's going to explain what it actually means. Um, one of the things like that... The program human. Yeah. machine work. Shh, shh. You know, a big thing in the fire community now is big machines. And I'm like, why do I need a big machine that I wouldn't be able to get the satisfaction of using myself? But yes, they have many machines that actually are programmed using this language to be part of my students. Um, but the way that you place your needle produces different patterns. 
be considered too legal, and it was called Nawali. And Nawali is a, either Egyptian or a Viking word that means a knot. And so they called it knot making, for example. And but I think that they did it through the back loop so that it made those knots or those stitches closer together and more wearable and longer lasting. Uh, they were virtually indestructible, which is why the early uh, textiles that were found in ancient Egypt and then also in the uh, from Viking community in North England, uh, the samples that they found that were left were samples of socks, um, mittens, and so forth. And I think it was because they knitted that way to produce a long wearing garment. Um, textiles typically, typically that were worn by early people um, did not last over the centuries because their body was breakable. And so they have very few samples of early, early um, textile production. And that's the reason is because they biodegrade. But um, what we do have, again, is reproducible in today's time because we can look at the stitch patterns and reproduce those stitch patterns. And it's because it was, as Dave says, well written code. <laughs> now, parallel. Um, one of the things that's real interesting is if you any assembly programmers in here? Okay, uh, if you don't program an assembly, what you do is you mainly have a stack of information that you put information on, and you stack more information on, and then you pull parts off. That's called uh, pushing and popping. In knitting, the various loops are pushed onto a stack or a needle, and then combined with another needle, go back the other way to pop them off. So it's very much like assembly language programming. And uh, the operands are very similar, where you're knitting or purling or you're doing it through the various back loops. History. Uh, there's thousands of years of fiber arts history, and of course we're going to cover it all in the next 15 minutes. But uh, actually we're sure just going to do highlights. Okay, so um, like I said before, these are some early examples of knitting or knotting. And uh, the, the bottom one is actually a Norse sock or a Viking sock. Um, and they, again, they weren't like what we call modern knitting. They, were, they used the technique of not making, uh, the people not making in a single loop. And, uh, and then the top ones are a pair of Viking ones. And you can see they're very thick, very sturdy. If you watch the TV show Vikings, Lagos is never saying, You boys take your mittens with you before you leave that English village. Uh, weaving was kind of the next big change. Uh, if you notice, there's these wooden boards that looked up various strands. Uh, when you look up the boards, you have a gap there where you feed in another piece of fiber that gives you your color changes and your pattern changes. And that eventually led to the Jacquard loom about 220, 250 years ago. You'd have hooks that would go down to lift up those very uh, longitudinal pieces of fiber. And if there was a hole, the hook went through. If there wasn't a hole, the hook didn't go through. Much like Howard's, Howard's punch cards that IBM made famous if you're over a certain age like I am, and you had to start programming on punch cards. Uh, you can actually encode this for various patterns and various pieces of data that you want to encode. Well, how that work, works? Well, the hooks come down, and they grab the various parts of the warp, which is the vertical fiber lines. And then you would have the weft, which is the crossover, which you have a shuttle with a piece of, of uh, material trailing it. And you do the various layering, various patterns, various colors to get what you want. And that's the basics of weaving. And that's how they started doing jacquard looms. And jacquard looms are still in production for things like drapes and heavy carpets. And if you want to buy your home kits, they're out there. Needle arts. One of the first needle arts uh, that we know in history was net making. Uh, some of the earliest uh, pieces of uh, uh, fiber that have been found were along, down, down along riverbanks in Egypt and Israel, and uh, where fishermen uh, created uh, articles of clothing and also nets. Um, and then also, um, uh, you know, in the Viking, uh, the Vikings did, we found pieces of fire and textiles that, that basically they think it was the earliest forms of textiles. Um, and again, they're biodegradable, so we don't really know how 
couple thousand years old at most. Uh, uh, then in the Middle Ages, textiles were predominantly controlled, or textile productions were uh, commonly controlled, uh, controlled by guilds, and it was an industry. And um, yeah, it, I could only find samples of guild membership by women in Germany. Uh, predominantly guild membership was by men, and so a lot of the early knitting in guilds in medieval Europe was by men. And uh, except in Germany, and the samples or the things that I found about about in Germany was the fact that uh, the textiles produced by women were like tapestry, like artistic textiles, picture textiles, and so forth. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. The other thing that I think is interesting too is that a lot of our modern knitting today has its roots um, as far as like stitch patterns and so forth. Um, color work comes from the Scottish Isles, and each, uh, there are various uh, areas in Scotland where, over centuries, uh, their local area produced certain types of knitting, like Aaron Cadlin, Aaron Sweater production, uh, came from the Aaron Isles, uh, Fair Isle, uh, which is color work, uh, like we think of Argyle Salt and so forth. They came from the different that 
community, and then you can go down on their path. And but everyone is given an opportunity on Ravelry to sell their product, and that's something that I think is really cool too. You don't have to apply. Um, you don't have to go through an application process and a testing process and so forth. And if you've got something cool and you want to post it to see if people, other people think it's cool, then you can post it and people can buy it from you. And so that, I think that's an awesome aspect as well. Yeah. Uh, the lady we're talking about, her name is Wooly Wormhead. That's not her real name. There's not a Mr. and Mrs. Woolhead who, or Wormhead who named their daughter Wooly. Uh, she's a hat designer. Matter of fact, she's the 2018 Knitting Designer of the Year for the British Crafts Award. Uh, I wrote her an email saying we were doing this talk and what what sort of processes she uses. And she said, oh, yeah, you're talking open source. So I use open source software for all my pattern uh, production. She uses Darktable and GIMP for graphics and uses the LibreOffice suite to uh, do a lot of things like charts, schematics, and layouts. Let him get his picture. Uh, the one thing she mentioned is that a lot of folks use proprietary software called Stitch Mastery, um, which is kind of clunky. However, you can get true type fonts from Stitch Mastery for their for their uh, their character set and embed that in other things. And that's a copy of the uh, the various carry, uh, character sets you can get out there. And she runs all this on an Ubuntu. So if you're a Ubuntu fan, yeah. And she uses that for a lot of her other ancillary stuff like PDF readers, merging, collage building, email, stuff like that. Uh, the only thing she's not open source on right now are her website, but she's going to move that to WordPress. And for text editing for her books, um, if you ever do anything electronic publishing, it's a very narrow field, and they usually want to be fed from proprietary pieces of software. Uh, one thing that kind of holds her back from using more is the lack of CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and I forget what K is, um, black. Um, unless you're really into uh, severe publishing, you don't really deal with that. I used to work for Xerox where we did a lot of that, and uh, it's a totally different world. But if you're a graphics designer working in the open source world and you want to really go someplace and get a lot of knitters liking you, start working on CMYK for them. Not just knitters. Any, any graphic production. Okay. So we'll charge out right after this good tape. Um, by the way, she said mentioned that whenever she had any problems with open source software, she got fantastic support to help her. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, she thinks that she's mainly in the desktop publishing built business. She makes designs, but her main way of making money is through desktop publishing. And we're kind of lacking there. Um, Open office writer isn't quite uh, up to task there. Now to Ravelry.com, um, another website that I emailed and said, "Well, what do you do? We're talking at, open, at an open source conference on your website. Uh, what do you have?" Well, almost immediately I got an email back said, "Oh yeah, we run Gen2 Linux. Uh, <laughs> they have all their servers at Acolo. Uh They're running MySQL 5.6, but they're moving to 8. Yay!" Um, uh, they've already upgraded the replicas. Mainly the uh, main framework is Ruby on Rails. Uh, these two use Sphinx for text searching, but that kind of fell apart as things start getting larger, as you're now using Manticore. And they're using S3 for storing images. So with that, some of the other normal stuff you see out there, like Redis, Memcache, and all that, HA Proxy, Nginx. So it's traditional open source stuff that you see out there. Now, the, the one thing that they really have over the open source world and the fiber world is project names. Okay, so up there. Um, Rick is here with us today, and he is a, a part, part owner of Pearl's Yarn Forum, and Rick has his all uh, indie dot yarn dyes, and his, well, this, he, you have two different lines, right? But one of them is based off of Dr. Dr. Wade. And so he has repeatable colorways for the different documents and documents. And so like, I bought a couple of those so I can get a face to 
Um, the one area that the, the fiber arts community really has it over us in the open source community is project names. We're kind of, um, frankly, boring. Apache was a, a pun on a patched server uh, from the old NCSA HTTP server. Uh, Gimp for graphics, Blender, Ubuntu, Kubernetes. They're cute. But how many of you would like to work on a project with this name? <laughs> so this is a a, a, a dye pattern, uh, colorways. Yeah, yeah, where the it keeps coming back. And um, as I said, that's that's kind of interesting. Now the next slide. This is one of the few PG thirteen pictures you'll find of this young lady. Her 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 uh, nom de plume is Countess of Blaze, and she um, she's kind of interesting in her in her in her colorways names. Uh, for those who don't speak English, English twee bollocks is, is the uh, the English phrase for small testicles. Uh, temporary state of euphoria. Shatner's bassoon. I'm not going to go into there. A face only a mother could love. Rebelling against suburbia. Roll Dolls Dictionary. I have a feeling here she's not talking about James and the Giant Peach. She's probably talking about some of his more infamous horror stories. No FKN Neon, or so FKN Neon. And one called My Beard is Covered by Intellectual Property. <laughs> How would you like to work on a project with that name? <laughs> yeah, I contributed to My Beard is Covered by Intellectual Property. I, I, this is a lady that, uh, that I follow quite a bit because I'm in love with her yarn. Her yarn is very bright and vibrant and, and just phenomenal. But um, I wanted to give you a little bit of her story. Um, she is uh, autistic. And uh, she said after she graduated from high school, she spent several years living on the street because she just could not fit into society. And uh, somehow she got into indie yarn and dyeing. So she was always a knitter and a crocheter. And that was her soothing mechanism and, and how she fit in. She sold some of her designs and so forth. And she got into indie dyeing. Now she has a wonderful um, uh, she has a design studio, and she doesn't really have a local yarn shop. You can go in there and buy yarn, but it is a design studio. And so she uh, hand dyes her own yarn. This past year, um, she now employs three people to help her uh, dye her yarn. And so her business has grown. It's an international business. Um, she has a yarn subscription that... It takes me about five weeks to receive my box in the mail, and it's like this really cool box. And she and photographs every step of opening and unwrapping the box. Yeah, my friend. I'm like, okay, this is what it looks like this time. And then I go, and then I look a little, and we're like, oh, okay, smart. And then she, um, she does this, and she's really into history. And so this year's yarn subscription is based off of uh, ancient architecture. And so her colorways that are only dyed for the, the yarn subscription, they're not her repeatable. These are her repeatable, some of her repeatable colorways. But these yarns are only dyed in small batches for the yarn subscription. And so it comes with a book, uh, like a booklet that she has professionally printed. And, uh, and you can read about, you know, whatever architectural building this year is about. And, and how that yarn fits in, and it also comes with, with another little gift. And the other little gift is really kind of funny. Um, usually it's very humorous. Um, sometimes it's very appropriate. I would say sometimes a little gift is, is not so appropriate, but it's kind of fun. Um, so I guess that's why, you know. But can you imagine going from living on streets, and this happens because, uh, predominantly because of rivalry, going from living on the streets, all the way to producing an international indie dye company. I mean, that's just phenomenal, the things that people are doing within the last 10 years. And basically, because of rivalry, bringing these people to a place where they can sell and reach a larger community. Well, what I hope the open source world can learn from the fiber world 
Um, first thing is active mentoring. Uh, you may have seen the fiber room down the hallway. Uh, they had five or six people show up with no knitting skills, and they walked out uh, after a couple hours of tutoring, being able to produce knitting projects. They're not masters of it. Uh, there's a learning curve there, but they were in instantly brought in and taught how to do. Uh, you show up at your local Linux users group thing, they're not going to teach you how to build kernels right away. Um, better pay attention paid to novices. They really, really take care of the newbies and getting them up to speed. Uh, you show up at your local meetup.com thing, um, unless they really, really, really are paying attention to the newbies, they figure, well, you're going to go through and read the manual anyway, so we'll get you a little bit along the way, but most of the emphasis is on the, the newbie to get up. More respect for everyone. There's no telling people go out and RTFM. Uh, for you knitters, I'll explain that later if you want. Uh, there's a, a lot of things in the computer world where someone has a question. It's like, oh, you could have answered that by just reading the manual. Well, the manual is 800 pages of incomprehensional gibberish, and it tends to drive away a lot of people. The other thing they do really well is having a focal point at Ravelry.com. In the computer world, uh, depending on your sub-branch, um, you might be able to get a good answer on slash.org or maybe um, Stack Overflow. Um, what's real funny is in the database world, Stack Overflow is kind of looked at as a minor disaster because you have people who are giving advice and opinions based on eight, nine, ten years ago, their experience when they set up a WordPress site once. Um, you go to Quora.com and you get opinions from folks who thought they set up a website five or six years ago. Um, but if you're in the knitting community, you have one place to go that's going to give you a great answer. Uh, we don't have that. And the other thing is better comradeship. Uh, my wife and these ladies here from the Dallas area, uh, they go to coffee shops, uh, they go to churches. They have a group meeting, and they're very welcoming of bringing people in. They actively seek out people to help. And um, even the most friendly lug that you go to um, is going to seem like a cold distant iceberg compared to these folks. And plus, they usually have coffee and other drinks around and food, which... Um, I wanted to say something, too. Um, my, uh, two years ago, when I retired from teaching, I, by the way, um, I learned how to knit uh, from some players. They were in a, um, uh, they were taking 3D art in the school or in one of the classes, and I had a group of students that, that they were knitting in my
and there's similar groups all around the world. Yeah, and, and so it's like that community, but the, the locus for that community is Ravelry.com. And so that's where we base it or house it. And also uh, uh, Facebook is where we post a lot of our meetups and so forth. Yeah, um, by the way, in, in some Scandinavian countries, teach knitting before they teach programming. Uh, make sure the kids can actually follow directions. Uh, also, I learned yesterday that after certain medical procedures, they're now testing people with knitting to help them rebuild their physical skill and their mental dexterity. Um, we'd like to go into questions and answers. If you have any questions about this, by the way, the, the gentleman in the top middle is one of the top designers. Uh, he's an American that lives in Amsterdam. And as you can see, he's kind of shy and reclusive there. <laughs> his, name is, his name is Stephen West. And he's a, a, just a brilliant designer. I have yet to have a chance to knit one of his designs because it's very free flowing. And as my friends will tell you, I'm more of a Kevlar knitter. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't free flow very well. Um, but I want to say this about him. He is actually from Oklahoma. And Oklahoma City, I think, if I remember right. And he has, again, a music head from Oklahoma City. I mean, guys, and he's living in Amsterdam. He owns a local yarn store with another lady. And he is an international designer. And, um, that screams Sooner Boomer, yeah. And just a phenomenal knitter. Um, the picture at the bottom of his knitted brain, um, Elizabeth Ricks White uh, uh, was wearing one yesterday. Repeatable pattern. And uh, it's, a, it's a cool thing. So, with that, any questions, comments? Yes, sir. There, there is one that somebody was telling me. What somebody in here, I think, was telling me about one yesterday that's phenomenal. But I don't mean. I did my research um, talking to him, and because we uh, we just wanted to kind of do a brief history, we were mostly talking about he wanted to talk about the open source stuff. But there are in action, which also if you make it to London, um, the uh, Albert and Victoria Museum has an excellent sample of uh, early pieces of textiles, and that's where that red uh, box. That is where that house, that box is housed. Um, and also, sometimes the cows that they can only stand from one. Um, and the Viking ones that we chose, um, they were actually in the museum in New York. And by the way, if you guys are ever in North England, it's one of them. Um, have you, has anybody ever traveled to New York? Um, it's one of the most well preserved medieval cities, and they excavated a down to the Viking era. There and uh, just like the TV show, the writing of they had a community there, and they you can take this little underground little kind of like one of those Disney boat riders, and you can actually see where they excavated, and you can see some of the early textiles and all, and it was pretty cool. If you ever made it there, I didn't have to go there, but anyway. Dickens and the Tale of Two Cities had Madame Defarge sending little messages in her knitting, and when the, when the good guys slash bad guys came by, she'd just rip it out, so the message was gone. Frank, do you have an example? Well, no, but I, I wanted to say that I, I really love your uh, you know, wet, wet coders and knitters working together, and it uh, seems to me my, my son is a, a budding coder. And I feel like um, one of the things that makes it hard to learn programming is um, when you're when you're starting out and you're learning the basics, like you have to make you have to make programs that have been written a hundred times, a thousand times before by thousands of different people. Um, when you're learning to knit, like you gotta have it. So like. Um, I think it's harder to motivate to like write a program that you know, well, I can just download a program that does that off the internet that's, you know, already debugged. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can 
can only write hello world in so many languages before you get absolutely bored. So. Right. So, um, like, the, the knitting has an actual product, whereas coding is, is, is more than a few. So, um, but uh, I, I feel like the, the true coders are the ones who don't, who don't care. Who like, like, when my son uh, wrote a program to help him build a crossword puzzle, and it's like, oh, I don't you know, you look on the internet and you can find one that is even more fully functioned, but part of the fun is writing it for, for yourself, so, you know, having that, um, that drive to, to do that, despite the fact that, yes, you can download something that already works, but you want to make something that, that works, you know, out of your own hands. Yeah, it, it's hard for a lot of folks who don't understand programmers that there's a certain amount of intestinal fortitude and stubbornness where, damn it, this is, works in the book, why doesn't it work for me? And that's how you actually learn how to debug code, which is not a direct teaching tool, but it's what happens. So, yes, sir? Uh, one, I guess, I was thinking about your point, like why the local blog groups sort of kind of reject like newcomers more than, you know, the welcoming knitting community. Yeah. You know, because I walked into the yarn group, but it's like, it's like a completely different field than walking in here. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just, like more than welcoming me, but I kind of feel like that a lot of group. And I noticed there's a lot of uh, cis admin type people that generally hang in that area. And Usually, as a cis admin, you're kind of more defensive and. Uh, you're used to saying no um, automatically. Hi, I'm Dave. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you kind of have to be defensive because, in a way, you're guarding a lot of secrets as a cis admin. You know, like you gotta, you know, make sure you don't reveal passwords and things like that. So, yeah. it's like a bit different of a mindset where you think you're just like, hey, I'm here to. Yeah. Well, a lot of it is also there's kind of a, a nerd elite meeting when you have several lugs where we have all these, oh, we're, we're so great. Oh, here's a newbie. We, you know, we'll show them how great we are by not helping along. Yes, sir. Yeah, actually, on that slide, I want to disagree with that. And, and this is possibly the difference between certain lugs and other lugs. So I found in my personal experience that the, my local one, whenever there's a new person walking in, they get swarmed on and say, hey, how can I help? Welcome to the thing. Are you looking for a job? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Austin Chick Tech. Uh, Austin Chick Tech, and he actually has gone on and done lessons in ISQL um, for uh, 12 to 18 year olds. 14 to 18, yeah. 14 to 18 year olds. Scary group. And I warned him, and I said, you were perfect. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, um, I was drinking through the entire thing. Oracle also has an uh, Oracle, it's called Oracle University. It, where they, they have an actual high school. We well, actually have a nice high school on Oracle's campus. Yeah, and a STEM, a STEM campus. But you're seeing more and more in the push in the STEM uh, for corporations, parents that are in the, uh, the computing industry to mentor. And, and I think that's a really cool thing because it develops those relationships. And again, that's the, that's the community uh, development. Um, we have one minute to go. And, and if you have an opportunity to mentor someone else in your field and develop community, I think both of us agree that that's one of the best things in the world because it feels you as a person. And with that, we are officially out of time. Um, Carrie's going to be in the yard room. I'm going to run to the thing. We can probably do one or two more questions if you want to do real quick, but that should probably be the end of the recording since. Uh, come see us afterwards. The knitting track's down there. I'm at the MySQL booth down around the corner. And thank you all for coming out. And I hope you have a wonderful day. And thank all of you.